All right. Well, good morning. Sing on. There we go. How's that? All right. So anyhow, um, ooh, today I was, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was thinking about what am I going to talk about, and I actually got inspiration when I was doing last time sermon on work because I read a lot of good things about the church. So I thought, well, why not do something about the church? And of course, it turned out to be a lot more than what I expected. And uh, half the time, just preparing for these, you learn an awful lot. Um, next slide, please. Oops, is there a clicker? Oh, there we go. There we go. There, there we go. So a um, few quotes here from uh, G.K. Chesterton. Just going to church does not make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage make you a car. The church is not a gallery for the exhibition of eminent Christians, but a school for the education of imperfect ones. Then the uh, next one is the coziness between church and state is good for the state and bad for the church. Now that's kind of an interesting one. I'll try to talk a little bit more about that later on if uh, time permitting. And, uh, and by the way, when I was looking up these quotes, it's amazing how many quotes were fairly um, critical of the church. And I think it's a shame, and, and actually from quite a few well-known pastors. And I think it's imperfect, important to remember that we are imperfect. The church has its faults because it's made up of sinful men and women. But yet, God uses it to His glory and is truly a force for good. And here we go. The church is not a select circle of the immaculate, but a home where the outcast may come in. It is not a palace with gate attendants and challenging sentinels along the entranceways, holding off at arm's length the stranger, but a hospital where the brokenhearted may be healed and where all the weary and troubled may find rest and counsel together. Again, I like to think of it as a place for healing. And who provides the healing? God the, Holy, God, the Holy Spirit, and especially His people who He has called to be in the church. We are His agents. Now, this is kind of interesting. It's a woodcut from uh, 1647 England. Um, and this is warning you about all the various sects and uh, opinions in England which could have dangerous trends. Um, I can't even make out some of these, but you have the Arminians there, the Arians, Anabaptists. Uh, you have the soul sleeper, and you have the divorcer. That probably would not fly in today's society, in today's modern church. So what is the church? All right. So I started looking up some words, some uh, stuff. Um, and I have like a little Charles Ryrie uh, systematic theology book. Uh, goes off initially in Hebrew, the word just simply means an assembly. And it's translated in the Septuagint as ecclesia. But it does not usually refer to a religious assembly or even to a congregation of human beings, though most often it refers to the congregation of Israel. So it's kind of like a secular term that we've taken and put some spiritual uh, framework to it. Genesis 28. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of people. So that company of people is actually the translation. So a word on translations. When you read your Bible, just be aware that sometimes the, the translators with the best intentions, I'm not saying they take liberties, but they try to take the Hebrew or the Greek and modify it as best they can into the modern day English which we speak. So just keep that in mind. And sometimes it's very helpful in Bible study if you do go back to the root word on what they were saying. And what we're going to find out here in the next few slides, there are at least three different words for church that are used throughout the Old and New Testament each one with a different meaning. Psalms 89.5, The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. All right. 
The Greek word ecclesia means an assembly again, very similar to the Hebrew, and was used in a political, not religious sense. It does not refer to the people, but to the meeting. In other words, when the people were not assembled together, they were not referred to as the ecclesia. And it goes on in Acts. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the people, the disciples not let them. So then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly, the ecclesia, was in confusion. And the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. And this is when Paul was being brought to trial. So that definitely was not the church as we think of it today. So where does it come in? All right, probably the best word that we would think of in church that's used in the Bible is belonging to the Lord. And that's what we are. We belong to God. And there's only two occurrences in the New Testament where this word is used. Uh, 1 Corinthians, therefore, when you meet together, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? It belongs to God. In Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. So in each case, the Lord's Supper and the Lord's Day is a time that belongs to God. All right, so let's take a look at the early church history. And what I've done is I've taken three common creeds that have been used in Christendom and looked at them and says, what does it say about the church? The very first one, the Neocene Creed, which was written 325, a long time ago, does not, if you go through it, and this is just the tail end of it, if you go through it, it doesn't even talk about the church. It just ends, and the Holy Ghost. Then you have the Creed in Constantinople, 381, where they obviously added a lot more words to the very tail end of it. And it talks about, and the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and with the Father and Son is together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. I love that word, spake. In one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So this has all been added. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I kind of like that. And then finally, you have the Apostles' Creed, which first started appearing around uh, 390, and which we more commonly know of, kind of gets it shortened up a little bit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, or the Holy Catholic Church. So, let's talk about what actually is the church. Uh, and again, I got this from the uh, Systematic Theology book. F four marks of the church to think about. One, uh, Ephesians 4, 5. There is only one body and one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all. So we are a unified body. Next one is holy. We are set apart for a special purpose by God. Jesus founded his church to continue his redemptive and sanctifying work in the world. Christians understand the holiness of the universal church to derive from Christ's holiness. And I think there's a theme here, holy. We are set apart for a special purpose. We are set apart from the world. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about what is the church and some of the secular meanings associated with that. Catholic. Catholic is derived from the Greek adjective meaning general or universal. And I might add in some languages, for example, in German, the, la the Latin Catholica was substituted by Christian even before the Reformation. Now, it, they also use Catholic as well. What I'm saying is, is that Catholic is, has, I don't say a secular meaning, but it, is, it can mean universal. Um, applied to the faith, the adjective Catholic also means that the church in the wholeness of the Christian faith is full and complete, all-embracing and with nothing lacking. And is proclaimed to all the people without excluding any part of the faith or class or group. 
And finally, apostolic. This is kind of interesting because we don't use the word apostolic in today's creed. But it describes the church's foundation and beliefs as rooted in the continuing in the living tradition of the apostles of Jesus. And I think this is important because too often we, take, we want to look, look at this snippet of life as it is right now. Here I am, a contemporary Christian in this world. You know, I'm an American living in Korea. This is what Christianity is. No, it is not. All right? There is a long history of faithful men and women called by God for the last 2,000 years that we would take well to pay attention to. Why did Christianity spread so quickly during the first few hundred years after Christ's death and resurrection? Was it because the church was sanctioned by the government? Was it that the local uh, Jewish leaders and the, and the Romans embraced the resurrection and embraced the church? No, they hounded the church. You know, Paul thought he was special when he uh, witnessed the stoning of Stephen. No, he was not. Many others followed in the steps and, see, and tried to see how many Christians they could kill. Why did Christianity spread? They spread because of the faithful testimony and the witness of the people who saw Christ crucified and resurrected. You had that living tradition of people say, I was there, I saw it. And they passed that down to other believers. They passed that down to their children. That was the church. We take, and because of their witness, because of what they passed down, because of the living proof of their testimony, Christianity spread. So today to say that we don't have anything to learn from history, I think is not a good thing. Now, talking about apostolic, um, obviously the Catholics, along with the Eastern Orthodox and a few other denominations, can claim that you know, unbroken lineage and tradition. Um, and it's kind of neat. You have to be a little bit careful with that. Um, if you read anything about Islam, the, re the big reason of the split between the Shiites and the Sunnis is because of their claim to their version of the apostolic tradition. All right. um, Protestantism holds that what preserves the apostolic continuity is the written word of the scriptures. A church is apostolic as it recognizes in practice the supreme authority of the scriptures. And I think that's very important to remember. Yes, we have history, but more importantly, we have God's word that has been passed down from generation to generation. What else can we say about the church? The church has been purchased with the blood of God's own son. I think we all know that, but it's worth remembering. Acts 20, be on your guard for yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And 1 Peter, but you, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, not the world's, but God's possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you and me out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been called out of the darkness of the world into his light. We have been called to be separated from the world. Now, interesting enough, when you read in the New Testament, where does the word church come in? And we think, well, it shows up a lot. And yes, it does, especially in the Pauline epistles and in James and those other books. But in the Gospels, it only appears twice. All right, Matthew 16. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdoms of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And this is a famous verse. I mean, I think we all know that. Now, it's kind of interesting, because if you look into what the Greek says, Peter means rock man. Hey, rock man. I mean, that's kind of a cool name. <laughs> Peter Mueller. 
that's right. However, in the next phrase, Christ uses the word Petra, which means upon this rock, a feminine form of rock, but is not a name. He does not say upon you, Peter, or upon your successors, but upon this rock, Petra, the divine revelation and profession of faith in Christ. He's right, so I must be right. <laughs> But, but I think, and this is what I mentioned earlier, it's important to understand language and where the words are. Here, Christ, in the same passage, uses two different forms of the word rock. The Greeks, do you know how many words there are for love in Greek? At least four. And C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves. I love my wife. I love my country. I love my child. I love my dog. Each one of those is a different type of love. And they, are, they use different words in Greek. So English, which we are also very proud of, I'm an English speaker, is somewhat limited in the words and expressions it uses. And that's why sometimes it pays, it's good to learn other languages because there are differences of meaning that you can pick up and thoughts and ideas. Just like you know, last time I talked about Baruf work as a profession or a calling by God, not just a secular job, but something that God has called you to do. Okay. Um, it goes on. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. All right. So now this is interesting because it talks about discipline in the church. And that's not something we do very much these days. I mean, the notion of church discipline is fraught with peril, especially in the United States. Um, there are many cases where churches have tried to do this and they've been sued by the aggrieved party and taken to the courts. But there was a time where this was actually kind of a big deal, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But even so, it does talk about, you know, I would hope that if I am seen done something wrong, that Brad or Peter or someone would pull me to the side, hey, John, you need to cool. You need to cool it. And this is where I think we can do a lot of good in the church as far as mutual encouragement. We're just not here to show up every Sunday, you know, sing a few songs and listen to the word. We are supposed to know each other and to encourage each other and to build each other up. You know, there's a lot in this world that is aimed at tearing down. I mean, the big deal right now about Facebook and the U.S. elections a couple of years ago was that foreign agents actually tried to create a divisiveness in the discussion. They wanted, you know, if you were people were over here, they wanted to bring people further apart. And they wanted people arguing against each other and tearing each other down. And we need to be different. All right, moving on here. Christ is the head of the church. Colossians, he is head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And Ephesians 1, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So obviously Christ is the head of the church. We all know that, but these are just two good passages that talk about that. So let's go, let's go back to the verse in Matthew where it talks about how the Christ commissioned to Peter, that he will build his church upon the rock. In Ephesians, it talks about, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of God's gift. Therefore, when he ascended on high, he, held, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, 
for the equipping of saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the divisiveness? No, it's the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Each one of us, so God in doing his work on earth didn't just leave us abandoned to our own methods, but he gave each one of us as gifts. Sean, you did a great job this morning. I must commend, I, I commend you. I enjoyed that. You probably will not see me doing that. <laughs> Getting me to clap. I have trouble just clapping in sync with everyone else. So, but seriously, and, and you know, and my wife, bless her heart, she, she works well with children. And, uh, and so, and so each, we all have our gifts. And, and so is don't worry about what your gift is. God has given you something. God ha and so, and the point is, is to encourage each other and so that we may be unified. Catholics and Protestants, we are all one under God. And of course, the goal is to become mature to achieve the fullness of Christ. A few other concepts of church. And again, I got this from the Systematic Theology book. And you don't realize it, but if you read after one of the scriptures, it does come out. It's not explicitly said, just like the Trinity, but it is there. First, is the, first there's the universal church. That is all believers in heaven and earth. And then there's the visible church. The local churches in various areas that you may be knowledgeable or acquainted of. For example, is there, is there some given church just down the road, and I know they have an English service of believers, right? And each one of us probably has a church back home from wherever country we're from, if we're not from Korea. And that's fine. That's the church that you know of. Love it and support it. And finally, there's the local church, that assembly which I have my primary and sustained relationship. And that happens to be, at least for my family, family the one over here. And so this is the church that we give our efforts uh, to encourage. First Corinthians, give no offense to either Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. And that actually talks on two levels. Obviously, give no offense to the church of God. Support the church of God. Build it up. Do not tear it down. If you do have criticisms of it, do it in private. But also to Jews and Greeks. So it's kind of like our secular interactions. Don't give any offense to the non-Christian around you. Love him, not try to point out how different you are from him. So why do we go to church? It's for fellowship and encouragement, for accountability, have other Christians see the way you live, prayer and support and unity of the spirit. And one thing I'll say from our, from our own perspective, um, I know there's probably a couple months where we're here where we didn't go to church, and we were just watching the video sermons. And we got convicted by that. It says, no, this is not good enough. We need to be back into the body of believers. Now, this is a little bit of a sidetrack. It talks about the church, but in a broader sense. I call it the great mystery. In fact, we're the men's Bible study, we just did a chapter called The Hidden Mystery of Christ. So, Minaj and I... <laughs> We're there. <laughs> but, but seriously, um, and, and this is a charge especially to the men. And if you remember this, men, in your marriage, you will stay faithful. You will have a good marriage. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? He died for it. He sacrificed himself. So men, you sacrifice yourself to your wives and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So we are responsible for our wives and for our family, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Okay, okay. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. We all belong, male and female, we all belong to Christ. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother 
and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to the Christ and the church. And I think, I kind of think Paul's referring to both. You know, the union of a man and a woman and, the, and Christ and the church are two great mysteries in our lives. And God will reveal that to you as time goes on. This is not something that comes overnight. But again, like everything else, men, you have a special responsibility to love sacrificially your wives. Let's go on to some other concepts of the church and the various uh, denominations. Roman Catholic, I actually like this one, is a divinely constituted society consisting of members from every race and nation, all holding one faith, all using the same sacraments as a means of holiness and salvation, all governed by nine Lee by the successor of uh, St. Peter. I like to get the apostolic succession squeezed in there, but that's okay. I, I, I'm good at that. Reformed. The, whole, the Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect. Okay, they got the uh, predestination theme in there. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion together with their children. And finally, the Baptist. The church is a company of visible saints called and separated from the world, called and separated from the world, by the word and the spirit of God to the visible profession of the faith of the gospel being baptized into that faith. And I, and I kind of like that just because I think each one is good and each has its own flavor. And we can learn from it. So why do we go to church? It's an act of obedience to God. And it honors the Lord's day. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. What better way to do that than to go to church? It's because we need to belong to a community of faith that includes our brothers and sisters in the Christ who are trying to live out the gospel as we are. We're trying. And we fail sometimes. I will fail. And it's easy to criticize. It's harder to build up. We need regular reminders of our standing in Christ, help in acknowledging and confessing our sins, and teaching about God's truth. We had a men's retreat a few uh, weeks ago, and I really appreciate Monty leading us off in confessing our sins to each other and just our struggles. We struggle. And hearing the other persons confess their struggles, like, I am not alone in this. And that is good. And Monty, I thank you for that. We need help facing the issues of life and faith as presented through the teachings in the Bible. To hear reminders of God's love and alternate to the constant messages of a culture that ignores God. You know, we come to church just so we can spend an hour out of our week talking about God instead of the constant barrage of news and the internet memes that we get every day. And finally, experience the artistic and creative expressions of faith in music, artwork, and other things. And I appreciate that, even though I can't clap. So what does it mean to be a church member? Now, I'm going to diverge a little bit here. Um, someone who has joined the universal church with a profession of faith, you are in fellowship with others and the Holy Spirit. You are trustworthy. We'll talk about that in a second. A supportive member of the body of believers and committed to building and growing the local church. Now, this is where I got the inspiration for this message. When I was reading... Um, uh, Max Weber's book, Protestantism and the Spirit of Capitalism, he also has a little bit snippet there about sex and churches in America. It was an essay he wrote a couple years afterwards. And, he and what happened was, after he wrote his book, he went on about a two-month whirlwind tour of the United States. He went everywhere, the Midwest, the South, the West. He just, he talked with common people. He witnessed, you know, you know Riverside baptisms in the South, you know, where the water was freezing. This is not something that a proper German intellectual does, all right? But he was almost like the 19th century Alex de Tocqueville. And he, and he was just amazed at the spirit and the vibrancy of American Christendom. And it's actually afterwards, he actually criticized quite heavily his own German Lutheranism as being dead compared to what he saw in America. But he said it was interesting. He was talking to one German doctor there and, you know, who just started seeing patients 
and he relayed a story where the first patient who comes to him, okay, he expects to hear him tell him what's, what's hurting, what his problem is. And the first thing he says to the doctor says, I am a member of the Second Baptist Church on Main Street. Why are you telling me this? And the reason why he was telling this is because I am a member of a respected church in this local community. You can trust me to pay my bills to you. That's what it meant. You know, we talk about being members of the church and we confuse things. I am sure the churches in late 19th century America, they had their evangelical crusades. Come to the tent meeting. Come to know Jesus. All right? And you went up front and you said, yeah, pray, I pray Lord Jesus. You need to be baptized because that's what good Baptists do. All right? So next week, you're going down to the river, man. You're getting dumped. All right? That does not make you a member of that church. If you want to be a member of that church, you had to prove your trustworthiness. You had to show that you were living the Christian life day in and day out. That you were financially responsible. That you paid your debts and that you earned a good living and you supported your family and were not in any need. Because if you could do that, then the church says you give the church a good reputation. We want you to help us, the church. And in turn, we will help you. And so it became a matter of importance that if you wanted to be someone in that community, you had to be a member of a respected church. Were there abuses? Sure. And even back in the turn of the century of America, Max Weber saw that social fabric fraying already. But here's a good quotation from someone says, anyone can believe what he likes. But if I discover that a client doesn't go to church, then I wouldn't trust him to pay me 50 cents. Why pay me if he doesn't believe in anything? That's true. If, you don't, if you're not worried about what God thinks of you, why should I be worry if Brad loans me $50? If I stiff him, so what? But once a person has been voted into church membership, the, set, the church or the sect, probably more accurately, will accompany him for the rest of his life in everything he does. If he moves to a different town, it will provide him with a testimonial without which he will not be accepted into the local church of his denomination. So if you do have to move, that Second Baptist Church on Main Street will give you a letter that you've been a member of that church in good standing. So when you go to the next state or whatever, you present that letter that says, okay, you were trustworthy in another community, we will take you in. So being members of the church, you know, I think size is important. A big, super big church probably is not a good thing. You don't get to know everyone, nor does the pastor and staff get to know you. If you look back in around 19th century, the churches were community churches, very much like this one today. Know each other per personally and mutual confession. One thing I would say about the church as well is that there's a difference, and I won't go into it, that'll be another message. Um, Let's just say this, the church strives to be accredited or supported by the government, and in turn it has to compromise itself. And that's not necessarily a good thing. We should strive.